Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy for giving us another opportunity, another new year to pledge to live our lives for you. I pray, Father, that you would allow your glory to be in this place as we continue to worship you through the word. I pray, Father, you would bless, it, bless our ears that we might hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a time of year that when a lot of people look back and evaluate the past year, and what do they do? They make a New Year's resolution. And they want to commit to that so badly. Sometimes we don't always follow through, do we? We're kind of like the guy that said, a New Year's resolution. Uh, the definition of that is one, one year that goes in one year and out the other. I know it's kind of weak and bad, but it's the only New Year's joke I can find. But a New Year's resolution is that way. I mean, people have great intentions. They look back on the past and they say, why didn't I achieve that? Why didn't I do that? I go to the gym and uh, every year in January, there are all these new faces and new bodies and they're exercising vigorously. Two weeks later, where'd they go? They forgot their resolution because it is tough to continue that physical regimen, especially when we want to see results right now. I think we're kind of like the lady that a friend of mine told me about. He was in GNC, and this lady walks in, and he said it was obvious that she really didn't exercise a whole lot, if you know what I mean. And she went straight up to the lady at the counter and said, do you have any of those pills that make you lose weight? He said, she said, I need some of those pills because I hate to diet, and I cannot stand the exercise. And I think we adopt that attitude sometimes spiritually, and we want to follow Jesus. We want to walk in His ways. But we get so tired. And if we just had a Jesus pill, I think a lot of people would take that. Uh, there's a, a friend of mine that uh, in his plight for his New Year's resolution, he wants to read through the Bible. He's made a pledge a lot of years that he would read it from cover to cover. And uh, I want to, to hold him accountable today, and I want to give a shout out, Rob, if you're watching this on YouTube, I want you to know that I want to hold you accountable this year. Now, I do that because I wanted to highlight that uh, our sermons are now uploaded to YouTube. You can link to that from our website, at, or you can go to YouTube, and you can put in there Oasis Sermons, Greg Smith, or Greg Smith Oasis, and you can find those. And uh, that's where they're at if, if you want uh, to watch that, if you miss a sermon or if you miss a point. And another thing is that we want to do better at communicating. We came out of last year with Dream Teams and Vision Day. One of the things that we want to do is kind of step into social media so we can communicate better and more effectively and more instantly as a body. So I want to highlight to you, too, to join our Facebook page. We're hoping that Facebook will be an avenue, one of the avenues that we're able to do that. Uh, and it's my pledge for the new year to get on Facebook. And, uh, and I want to make that resolution to do that. Join me with that, and we'll try to communicate a little bit better. We are beginning a two-week sermon series today that has the potential to the effect your eternity and your eternity with God. We're calling it Start Strong because how you start something like a new year, is really important. I've heard it said it's not how you start, it's how you finish that counts. And I believe in finishing strong, but I believe in starting strong as well because it matters how you start your day, it matters how you start your week, and it matters how you start your year. Jesus, when he was teaching in his famous sermon on the mount, he taught about three practices that every Christian ought to engage in. And I'm going to cover two of those uh, with fasting and prayer and talk about prayer mainly today. But there is no shortcut. There is no quick pill. Something that you can take to have quick success in these three areas. But each area requires discipline and stick to and accountability. Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. The law of starting strong begins with putting Jesus Christ first in our life. And here in the Sermon on the Mount, he establishes this pattern of three that when you give, when you pray, and when you fast, 
that your life can be changed dramatically. You can have great spiritual breakthroughs for the future. And that's what starting strong can entail for each of us this year. Theologian John Stott said the Sermon on the Mount is the best known part of Jesus' teaching and certainly the least obeyed. And isn't that true? Because spiritual discipline like physical exercise is so difficult to maintain sometimes because it takes a lot of effort, a lot of work to do. So what I want to do at the beginning of this year is to challenge each of you and the entire church to commit to this 21 day challenge, this 21 days of devotion challenge to begin our year right. And I want this to start after next Sunday. So I want to talk again next Sunday and I want this kind of to begin. You can get a jump start and start praying earlier. I'm not, not challenging that. But I want us to focus on prayer and fasting. We've already challenged you to do the giving part. Last October we had the 90 day tithing challenge. That's where we had the video. That ends at the end of January. And there have been some great spiritual breakthroughs. Great things that God has done in people's lives as a result of them doing money God's ways. So now if we can get prayer and fasting kind of lumped together, maybe we can transform our lives, this church, and even our community like never before if we decide to do things God's way when it comes to also prayer and fasting. And I'm excited to see about what, what God's going to do in people's lives during this 21 days of devotion. There's tremendous power in the life of the Christian when we do life God's way. When we start the first day, when we give the first part of every day in prayer, when we give the first day of every week in worship, when we give the first portion of every dollar, when we give the first consideration in every decision that we make to God, and you set the course of the new year by what you do during this first month of a new year. So today I want to talk primarily about the power of prayer and the effectiveness of prayer and how God alters the future when His people pray. So I want to highlight how God answered prayers dramatically in the Bible. Now, I first want to look at uh, a fellow by the name of Hezekiah and his prayers by looking at 2 Kings chapter 18. If you want to turn there, we'll have the screens printed up or the verses printed up on the screen as well. But God answered prayers dramatically. We could have highlighted a variety of people's prayers in the Old Testament. We could have looked at Elijah who prayed that God would send fire down from heaven to prove that he was God. Or Jonah with seaweed wrapped around his neck, praying in the belly of a great fish that he would be rescued. Or Gideon who put out a fleece looking for God to demonstrate a dramatic sign for him to, to set the course for his future. Hannah prayed when she was barren. And then she gave birth to Samuel. Samson praying in the very end that he could obey the will of God again in his life. And he prayed that prayer. Daniel kneeling at the window praying and fasting that God would spare him from his enemies in the den of lions. In 2 Kings in Scripture, chapter 18, the Bible tells us about King Hezekiah. Now Hezekiah was a different political ruler in his day. In fact, he was a righteous ruler. The Bible describes him as a person who did what was right in the eyes of God. So let's read about this account and talk about how God answered prayer dramatically in the life of Hezekiah and his people. 2 Kings chapter 18, beginning with verse 5, reads that Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before he held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands of the Lord. The Lord had given Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. Now, during the 14th year of Hezekiah's administration, there was a great danger that befell the nation. The borders had been compromised. The enemy the enemy soldiers, the enemy kings were about to come upon Jerusalem, the capital, and pummel it like they had pummeled all the surrounding nations. And the king that led that opposing charge had hundreds and thousands 
of enemy soldiers surround Jerusalem. And Sennacherib sent a sarcastic letter to Hezekiah, and he told him what was going to befall this nation of God. And I want to read this uh, out of the Living Bible because it kind of gives a little bit more of a descriptive version of this account. So this letter is sent to King Hezekiah by this opposing king, and this is how it read. Don't be fooled by that God you trust in. Don't believe it when he says that I will conquer Jerusalem. You know perfectly well what the kings of Assyria have done wherever they have gone. They have completely destroyed everything. Why would you be any different? Have the gods of the other nations delivered them? No. And the same thing is going to happen to you, so surrender, and we'll take it easy on you when we take you into captivity. Well, Hezekiah received this letter, threatening letter, and you know what Hezekiah did? I think Hezekiah did what he always did. He took that letter, and he took it to the temple, and he prayed to his God. He prayed to our God, and in chapter 19, it describes and tells us what Hezekiah prayed in chapter 19, verse 14. It says this, that Hezekiah went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out, spread the letter out, the scroll out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made the heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your ears, O Lord, and see. Listen to the words of Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. Hezekiah is praying and he's saying, Lord, look, they're insulting you. Not that they're going to kill us, but you know they're really wanting to get after you. He's reminding God that, hey, the guy's threatening you. Verse 17, it's true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wooden stone fashioned by men's hands. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms on the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God. Now, if you get in a situation where you know there is no way out, what should you do? You should pray. There was nothing Hezekiah and their army could do but to pray and ask for God to intervene against these 185,000 soldiers plus. And God heard Hezekiah's prayer. And that impossible situation turned into a situation where God was glorified. And in that very night, God sent an angel of the Lord to the enemy camp. And 185,000 men were put to death. They woke up the next morning. All these dead bodies lying around in the enemy camp. And what do you think the commander did? Verse 36 says, So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. And Hezekiah and the city were spared. And the king went on. What a dramatic answer to prayer. Now, the next chapter, in 2 Kings chapter 20, it tells of another dramatic prayer that Hezekiah offered up and God changed the course of the future events because of that prayer. Hezekiah got sick and the prophet Isaiah informed him that you're going to die. Well, what do you do when you've been given the news that you're going to die? You pray. Chapter 20 verse 1 says, In those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you're going to die. You will not recover. Now God's not a practical joker. He doesn't tell you things that's not going to happen. So what's going on here? He told the king, King, you're going to die. Go prepare for death. Go to the funeral home. Make your arrangements. Get your will in order. You're going to die. Look at the response of Hezekiah, verse 2. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. And he prayed to the Lord. Now, why do you think he turned his face to the wall? He probably didn't want to see his attendants crying and being upset. 
And it doesn't matter how of a great ruler you are. If you're informed you're going to die, that's going to hurt. Woody Allen talked about his fear of death, if you remember hearing that quote. You know, he said, I don't fear death, I just don't want to be there when it happens. Death is a scary thing. And you go to the Lord in prayer. And King Hezekiah pleaded to God. Verse 3 goes on. Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And it says, Hezekiah wept bitterly. But God heard Hezekiah's prayer and interceded. Listen to verse 4. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord, or God spoke to Hezekiah, came to him, Go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life. You know, sometimes prayer needs to be a long and continued vigil. But sometimes a prayer needs to be instant, intense, and tearful. God hears them all, and He answers some the way that we want. But God changed the course of events here and added 15 years to the life of Hezekiah. Now Hezekiah's story really doesn't have a happy ending. In those last 15 years, a couple of things happened where he maybe he became prideful, maybe he became complacent. And, but one of the things that happened during that 15 years was that the Babylonian, uh, an envoy came from Bab Babylon and uh, pri out of Hezekiah's pride, he showed him all of their weaponry and their armory and he showed him all the spoils of war and it incited a bloodlust in the enemy and the prophet would later tell Hezekiah, the time is coming when everything in this palace will be taken captive to Babylon. During that 15 year extension, Hezekiah gave birth to a child named Manasseh who became the most wicked king ever in the land. So when God answers prayers dramatically in our life, we should never become complacent or have a spiritual pride develop within us because you might be walking in God's will one day, but that doesn't mean that you're always going to be walking in God's will without deliberate action on your part. The Bible says, be careful when you think you stand, lest you fall. I want to look at a dramatic prayer now in the New Testament. The prayers of Peter and the church in Acts chapter 12. In Acts chapter 12, we find uh, probably one of the most dramatic answers to prayer in the New Testament. And it's when Peter had been imprisoned. Herod had taken some of the people, some of the leaders of the church of that day. And what did he do? He, he put them in jail and this kind of pleased the people who hated Christianity, this new movement in the land. And, and Herod had, had James uh, beheaded. And I mean, when you behead somebody, that kind of gets the people's attention. And... The people like that, so Herod went and got Simon Peter, threw him in prison with the intention of putting him to death. And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James' brother John put to death with a sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. At verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church, it says, was earnestly praying to God for him. So the church had this spontaneous prayer vigil, this prayer meeting, and they gathered together in continuous prayer that they uplifted to God on behalf of Peter. There is special power when the church prays together for a specific cause. Jesus said this, If two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. God answers unified prayers of the church 
You may hear people pray, Father God, let you be in agreement with us. Or people say, I'm in agreement with him when they pray. They're referring to this agreement that Jesus is talking about. And God answered dramatic prayer. I want to read this again from the uh, Living Bible, verses 6 through 12. It tells a story about how God dramatically answered this prayer of the church. That night, while Peter was sleeping, guarded by four soldiers, an angel appeared quietly in the cell. The angel slapped him on the side to awaken him and whispered, Peter, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. The angel said, get dressed and follow me. Peter left with the heavenly visitor, not knowing if he was dreaming or whether to believe it was really happening to him. They passed the first and second cell blocks and came to the iron gate to the street, and this opened to them of its own accord. Now, they didn't have automatic door openers in that day. I mean, this was a genuine miracle. So they passed through and walked along together for a block, and then the angel left, and Peter finally realized what happened. It's really true, he said to himself. The Lord has sent his angel to save me. After a little thought, he went to the home of Mary, mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for a prayer meeting. So here is Peter. Uh, God intervenes. He's allowed to escape prison. And here are these people are continuing to pray for Peter on the behalf of Peter. And verse 13 continues that, that Peter went to the house and Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening the door and exclaimed, Peter's at the door! You're out of your mind! They told her. When she kept insisting it was so, they said, it must be his angel. You're out of your mind! Here they're praying, but they cannot believe that God answered their prayer. But isn't that what we do? We pray sometimes, and then God answers it dramatically, and or we pray and we don't think He's going to answer. You know, you, you go in to see a patient at the hospital, and, and you go in and you pray, Lord, please heal this person, and you walk out and somebody say, how, says, how is it? And, and you say, you know, it just doesn't look too good. Or, you know, your teenager gets her license for the first time and you pray that God would protect them. They're two minutes late from curfew and you go, oh God, I know they've been in an accident. Or, you know, you, you pray that God would forgive you your sins. You've got a terrible past and you wake up the next day and you think, God couldn't forgive me all of my sins, all of my mistakes. Verse 16 says, Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Here he keeps knocking and he's got to be thinking, I can get out of jail, but I can't get into a prayer meeting. What's wrong with the picture? <coughs> but they opened the door and they couldn't believe that God had answered their prayer. The book of James says this when we, when we pray. It says, believe and do not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. It doesn't mean that when we pray, man, we got to be the power of positive thinking. God's going to answer everything the way that we pray. That's not going to happen. But when we pray, we're confident that God's going to answer. And that we can trust Him. That if He doesn't even answer the way that we want it, that He's going to give us the strength to endure it. But God hears <clears throat> every prayer. And God answers prayers still dramatically today. I heard about this story about Sandy and Joe who went sailing off the Gulf of, of uh, Mexico in, in their sailboat. And this unexpected storm came up so bad that it broke their mast and they went for two days. They were pushed out to sea. They, their water was depleted. As the sun kept shining, they became more and more in despair, thinking that nobody was going to come by and save them. After the third day, Joe kind of slid down in the bottom of that craft, thinking he was going to die. And at that moment in their despair, Sandy, whose dog had been with them the whole time, the dog looked up at Sandy, and Sandy prayed, Oh God, just as my 
dog looks to me as its master and trusts me. Oh, Father, would you please intervene and rescue you, us. You are our master. You are in control. After that prayer, almost immediately, Sandy looked up and saw what she thought to be a cross appear on the horizon. She got Joe's attention and they determined it wasn't a hallucination. And they, as they continued to watch that cross get larger, they realized it was the mass of a large yacht approaching them. And they couldn't believe it. And they got up on that craft of theirs and they were waving, trying to get the attention. And it kept coming straight for them. And they thought, if this thing keeps coming straight at us, it's just going to crush us and split our vessel. And we're certain to die. And about then, they saw a little boy appear. And then he disappeared and came back with his dad and the, the yacht came alongside the broken vessel and saved San and Joe and their pet. And Sandy just couldn't believe it. And she said to Sandy, it's incredible that you found us. We thought that we'd never be found. And the owner of the yacht responded, what's really incredible, we've been on autopilot for hours and we're 10 miles off course. Coincident? Or God answered? I've seen God answer prayer dramatically in my own life. i just become a Christian at age 20, started singing with the church choir. And uh, all of a sudden I went deaf in my right ear. And then you can't sing when you're deaf in your right ear, you know, you, you can't hold a tone. And uh, I was troubled by it, went to the doctor, he did all these tests. And you know what he determined? You're deaf in your right ear. <laughs> he did this battery of tests, they could not figure out why I was deaf in my right ear. Anything unusual happened, well, you know, the one, the one thing that had happened, I had drank ginseng tea, somebody had dug up this root and made tea about it, out of it, and I drank it. And, uh, but I went back after that doctor visit and I asked him, the church, would you pray for me? And I prayed three days later, my hearing came completely back. Doctors couldn't figure out what happened. Coincidence or God incident? I gave glory to God and I stayed away from ginseng tea <laughs> from that point on. But I've seen God answer prayer dramatically in this church. <clears throat> The finances of this church got it became so difficult at one point around June or so that the, we became alert to that as, as a leadership and uh, we uh, one one time we we had uh, so much going out one month that we didn't have enough coming in and, and we we started praying like never before <clears throat> and uh, we started praying about that. Uh, then we had a, 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 a money series that, that I was preaching, and uh, we presented the 90-day challenge and talked about how, how the Christians should give to God, and we saw how God dramatically answered prayers through that event. I mean, it was like overnight that the, the income stuff changed in the church budget. And uh, at the end of December, I'm not sure how much we have, but I think we have a few uh, thousand dollars maybe in the regular fund. And the people are so excited about after Vision Day about getting into a permanent facility, even though we appreciate this gym and meeting here, that some people wanted to start a building fund or a next steps fund. There are people outside of this church that are excited about what we're doing and they've sent us money. And people have given money, so we kind of just put this fund together so we can watch it. We have $4,700 in this, in this building fund. I mean, God incident or coincidence? And we're continuing to pray. And we're praying for a financial team to come together that can make heads and tails of that and be able to establish budgets and present this communication to the body so we can all rejoice when we see what God does in response to prayer. James says, is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. And I'm sure some people say, man, eh, you know, coincidence. But we believe in God incidents. 
and that God answers prayers dramatically still today. That's why I want to challenge you to start strong at the beginning of this year like never before in your life. That things will change in your life by establishing prayer and fasting for this 21 days of devotion starting after next Sunday to really get serious. That this isn't just going to be a whimsical New Year's resolution that you will pledge to do this and hopefully what we will pledge to start will carry on through the end of the year. We'll evaluate and look back on the year 2012 and we will be able to see what God has decisively done because we have acted, we have stayed the course, and we have remained faithful as His people. So I want to kind of emphasize today uh, some definitions about prayer and fasting. And one is uh, about prayer. That prayer, prayer is purposeful dialogue with God. Prayer is purposeful dialogue with God. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus prayed, Jesus said, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Jesus is saying, look, there are people that get up and stand and they just babble on and they talk and talk because they just want to be heard of men. They're not really having dialogue with God. Prayer is purposeful dialogue with God. When Jesus said that, the previous verse says in verse 6, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who's unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. There are times when... Christians should be praying, and I challenge you through this 21 days of devotion, and that it may extend through 2012, that we give the first portion of every day in prayer to God. It is purposeful dialogue with God, and you just have a conversation to God like you're having with all these other people that you're talking with through the day, but you have that with God, and it's purposeful, and we do that knowing that God is hearing our prayers. So we should pray individually. Every day. And we should also be praying collectively as a church. In Acts 4.24, it says they raise their voices together in prayer to God. And the church lifted up their voices. And they rallied around a cause such as for Peter, for his escape from prison in the early church. And so we pray collectively for things about this church that we would grow deep, that we would impact our community that we would pray for wisdom for the future and for each other, for ourselves. Prayer is a powerful part of the Christian walk. And a lot of times we never get that right. There is no prayer pill. It takes diligence to be a successful prayer like Hezekiah was a successful prayer. And that's what I'm challenging you to do during this 21 days of devotion. To set aside a specific portion, the first portion of every day, in a specific place, and to pray. And I suggest that you take notes and get a notebook or use your computer or your smartphone and you talk about, you list what you're praying for specifically so you don't forget for when God answers that you can write that answer and you know it. And it's not going to be a coincidence anymore. It's going to be a God incident in your life. Somebody said that God answers prayer in one of four ways. Yes, no, wait, and you got to be kidding. But we need to be a people of prayer. And that's what I'm challenging you to do, like never before, to start strong the year of 2012 in prayer. I want to give you a definition about fasting. Fasting is refraining from food for a spiritual purpose. I read a book over break while I was gone entitled Fasting, The Private Discipline That Brings Public Reward. And on the back cover it said this, if Jesus could have accomplished everything he came to do without fasting, why did he fast? That blew me away. I never thought about that. Jesus himself, God's Son, God in the flesh, fasted. It went on to say the Son of God fasted because He knew there were supernatural things that could not be released any other way. How much more should fasting be common practice in our lives? Now, 25 years ago when I first became a Christian, I fasted a little bit. But you know what? I hate to fast. 
I hate to not eat. It gives me headaches. I get sick. But I want to challenge myself and you to fast, to be lumped in the threes that Jesus is talking about, about giving and praying and fasting, to have a spiritual breakthrough. And we're going to learn more about that next week from the absolute fast to the Daniel fast where there's graduated forms of fasting. But this, the book said this, I want to quote, it's up on the screen. Tremendous rewards await those who seek God through the discipline of fasting both corporately and individually. So after next week, after we learn more about fasting, we're going to start collectively and individually as a church to pray and fast for 21 days of devotion so we can have great and lasting spiritual breakthroughs in our life. And what I want to close with right now is I want to give you a list of 10 things that I want you to add. You can write them down. We'll probably put it on a special card next week. Uh, we're going to have it up on the screen right now, so kind of write fast if you're going to write it down. You can start early. Ten, ten areas where I want you to specifically pray as a church body. And that is one about our country. That God would be invited back into the United States of America. And that we should be praying for the election 2012, specifically for the President of the United States that we could pray God's will be done in this nation. And that we would pray for our community. Financial Peace University, or FPU, by Dave Ramsey. We're going to offer this course in a month or so from now for the entire community and for this church. And pray. there are people that are strapped financially. They are hurting because of spending issues, because of income issues. And we pray for our community that that will be a great help for our community. I pray that abortion would be eradicated in Pueblo County, that God would allow for the change of the course of events because of the involvement and the prayers of God's people, that we would pray for this church, that we would pray for small groups, our connect groups that are starting up in a few weeks, that you would get signed up and understand that this might be outside of your comfort zone to go to somebody's house, but we want to pledge as a church that this not a fan series would be a spiritual breakthrough for many people's lives.